strong expectation in the region that the Westpac rescue helicopter will always be on hand in an emergency. Indeed, scarcely a day goes by without the chopper and its crew attending a rescue or rushing the hunters sick and injured to hospitals in Newcastle and Sydney. Well, that may no longer be the case unless the public contributes a million dollars to a fundraising appeal launched today. This target figure, combined with corporate sponsorship and funds raised from the sale of the existing chopper, would pay for a twin-engine machine. While superior in terms of endurance, speed and patient care facilities, it's not just a question of upgrading the existing service. The Department of Transport and Communications has placed severe restrictions on the use of single-engine helicopters, limiting access to some Sydney hospital helipads. We are going to face severe restrictions uh, and uh, not only that but there will be aircraft, patients will not be transferred anywhere near as routinely by helicopter and where indeed they do need to be transferred it will be done from Sydney which of course uh, we don't want to see happen. It's going to cause considerable time delays and, and with our retrieval systems already set up, set up within the Hunter uh, we certainly don't want to see that sort of thing happen. At today's launch, Dr Owen James from the Department of Health gave his unqualified support for the scheme. He said the rescue service is already the best in the state and has saved hundreds of lives. If the Westpac rescue service was forced to shut down, the hunter would not be without a helicopter for emergencies. Another operator, such as Careflight, would take over the role. However, John Skeen is adamant it could not do as good a job. Absolutely not. There's no way in the world that a service can replace what we're providing here in the Hunter at the moment, free of charge, uh, can be replaced by a Sydney operation regardless of who it was operating or how it was operated. During a tour of Australia, the Reverend Dr Brian Wren is conducting a series of workshops. He's focusing on a variety of topics, including music in congregational life and creative writing for worship. Dr Wren is based in the UK and has been writing hymns for more than 20 years. Today he passed on some of his experience to a group at a seminar at St John's College at Morpeth. Several of Dr Wren's works are in the Australian hymn book and a publication called Sing Alleluia. Naturally, he believes hymns are important. The things that people learn in childhood stay with them throughout life. And in times of crisis, it's when people have got a, a church background, it's the hymns they remember that help them through. And so the words are not just things we slip into and out of that, they become part of us. Dr. Wren's interest in the use of language in religious worship has led him into controversial areas. He's in favour of referring to God as God the Mother or God the Sister, as well as the traditional God the Father. Raises a lot of, um, a lot of issues. Some people are very affirmed and liberated by it, men and women. Some are very frightened by it. I was myself when I first began to. And I think that's the fear of something new, and also because it puts in question a male-dominated society and church, and for some people that is a problem. How important are hymns to every? Tonight in NBN News, 34,000 bales of wool will go under the hammer this week at the Newcastle August sales. In recent months, New England wool has brought mammoth prices and that should continue with overseas buyers here in droves prepared to pay plenty for the golden fleece. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Judges have awarded Greg and Edna Petfield of Adamstown Heights the Grand Champion Prize in the 1988 Mataro Garden competition. As Newcastle and Lakes District's Grand Champion, the garden in Lexington Parade is spectacular. Mr Petfield says judges were pleased to see the Australian flag flying in his front yard during the bicentennial year. Outstanding living features of the garden include these highly colourful azaleas and a pergola smothered in jasmine, which sends fragrance wafting through the garden. Was it a surprise when you found out you'd won? Oh, big surprise. A wonderful surprise, but I really wasn't expecting it. What sort of celebrations are there going to be now? Oh, oh 
have to come back down to work before I can work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> a garden in Jessen Parade at Warners Bay was awarded the Reserve Grand Champion Prize, while Lambton this year hosts the best garden over 605 square metres in the Newcastle and Lakes districts. The garden in Illalung Road was landscaped by William Mallam. His wife Lucy has tended it for hours each day ever since and has now been rewarded for her efforts. Mrs Mallam says she's enjoyed gardening since she was a little girl and although she's not giving away her exact age now, she's proud to admit she's in her late 70s. She doesn't know what gave her the winning edge and modestly adds her award has left her dumbfounded. Winning gardens will be open for public inspection from this Saturday through until September the 11th. Good afternoon, I'm Belinda Borisso. Tonight, Maitland City Council responds to calls for the removal of the city's 1955 flood level indicators. Some say real estate prices are being affected and something should be done to combat the problem. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. The Mirage has the distinction of being the longest serving air defence fighter in Australia's history. For 25 years it graced the skies as a short range point to point fighter. But times and technology change. With the emphasis now on long range defence, the twin engine Hornet is considered state of the art. It's advanced radar and weapon systems. Only one squadron in Australia still flies Mirages, 75 Squadron in Darwin. By the end of the month, the base will be re-equipped with Hornets and the Mirage will finally fly no more. Pilots from 75 Squadron are at Williamstown training for the changeover. While welcoming the new technology, Wing Commander Bill Evans says the Mirage is a joy to fly. Well, we refer to the Mirage as the uh, grand old French lady and uh, it reflects the French aesthetics in design and uh, I feel it was one of Monsieur Dassault's finest. It served a lot of Air Force as well, not just Australia. And uh, as you can see behind us, it looks like it's doing 100 knots uh, standing still. But few words are wasted at Air Force farewells. Pilots prefer action. And today they were back in the cockpit of the craft they love for an historic flight mask. A rare sight indeed as three generations of fighters took to the skies above Williamtown, Port Stephens and Newcastle. The Hornet was first followed by a Mirage from 75 Squadron, and then the oldest fighter, an Avon Sabre from the Richmond Air Force Base, delivered to the RAAF in 1956. Tomorrow, five Mirages will fly in formation along the coast. The very last opportunity people on the eastern seaboard will have to catch sight of the fighters. Newcastle and its surrounding areas should be able to see the planes overhead round 20 past two tomorrow afternoon. The children at Raymond Terrace Public School weren't too shy to clown around with a red nose on their annual sports day. That a These kids, however, are just a part of the 17,000 schools around Australia involved, plus hospitals, shops, factories and government departments. It's a clever appeal to grab attention and much needed funds for a killer syndrome. It is hoped that a million red noses will be sold Australia-wide, 25,000 of those in the Hunter. 
It's a light-hearted approach to a very serious problem. Doctors are still mystified by the causes of cot death. The money raised will go to research into why 570 babies die in Australia each year. 15 of those in the Hunter. Red Nose Day is the one day of the year where being nosy is actually being helpful. In tonight's News at 6, we start our series of profiles of the Hunter and Central Coast Olympians. Tonight, we feature tennis player Liz Smiley from Salamander. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. The science department and in particular students of Belmont High School. In particular we'd like to thank the represent 10 different regions in the state. They're competing in five divisions with the less experienced gymnasts competing today, second and third divisions tomorrow and the elite first division competing on Thursday. The girls ranging from 11 to 18 years old have to perform maneuvers in four gymnastic disciplines. High and low bars, balance beam, and the vault. One of the stars of the day was 13-year-old Stacey Wilde from Wiley Park High in Sydney. Stacey is the national rhythmic champion and is touted as a 1992 Olympic representative. In the last four years, the Hunter team has won the regional point score twice and with talented such as Tracy Wood from Paris and Cam and G from Newcastle High, Prospects are looking good for 1988. Tony picked up his new title after five rounds of racing in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Queensland. Not that he isn't used to winning, with five Australian titles and 16 state titles already on his belt. He's been riding bikes for eight years now, climbing from the less powerful mini bikes to the 125 Yamaha. In year 10 at Curry High, Tony is one minded in his desire to succeed, keeping at peak fitness running and working out, and of course doing the odd lap around the racetrack. I'm putting in 100% um, effort leading up towards big title meetings. Like, I'm riding every day of the week, any spare moments I get. Winning the kid motocross title is for Tony just a small step towards greater things. Craig Dack, Australia's Mr Motocross for the last three years, was also the Australian kid motocross champion. He is now reckoned to be a millionaire. What are you in it for, the fun, the money or the glamour? Well, I'm in it for the lot. In all, two trucks, both towing trailers, six cars and a van were involved in a pileup. While some were smarting only from a minor dent or two, others, like this multicoloured variety, looked to have ended their days. In fact, there were two separate incidents. The first involved a pedestrian knocked down at the lights of the Park Avenue intersection. As expected, a bank-up of traffic occurred back up Northcote Drive 
while the slightly injured person was attended to and then taken off to hospital. Apart from a minor traffic snarl, that would have been the end of it, until a vehicle coming down the hill couldn't stop before setting off a chain of collisions. Even though some of the cars were bent quite badly, only two people from the Shamozzle, who suffered apparently only slight injuries, had to be taken off to hospital. A couple of policemen were still at the scene as darkness approached, jotting down accounts of the mishaps. Maybe they'll be able to decide who hit who and why, and therefore who'll be paying the bills. This afternoon, gallery director Sandra Murray was preparing the paintings for hanging. On Thursday, the exhibition will open to the public with many of the 46 works for sale. Prices will range from just over $100 to $4,500. The first and the second prize paintings are not for sale. They'll remain in the gallery's permanent collection. The winning entry, titled Painting with Diligence, is by Sydney artist Rodney Popel. The oil on woodwork was described as opulently ironic by competition judge William Wright, the assistant director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. 36-year-old Popel receives $5,000 for his effort, donated by Charlestown Shopping Square. Another Sydney artist, Anthony Galbraith, picked up second prize of $1,000 from the Lake Macquarie City Council for his untitled work in mixed media. As the competition was by invitation only, the standard of the collection is very high. There's a healthy balance between local entries and works by artists from throughout New South Wales and interstate. Newcastle's Jane Lander was commended for her painting Down and Out. The unusual piece Champion Butchers by fellow Novocastrian Ross Woodrow was also commended, along with Dallas Bray's Use This Land Too. Now in its third year, the competition has become the Lake Macquarie Gallery's main means of adding to its small but quality collection of works by contemporary Australian artists. It had been hoped a bicentennial authority grant could be used to develop a public park at Greenpoint but funds weren't forthcoming. The Lake Macquarie City Council says it couldn't afford to pay for the park itself, so it has turned to a business group to establish the park, along with a residential and tourist development, an extension of the Valentine Residential Project. The area of land involved stretches between Valentine and Belmont, covering about 220 hectares. Half would become parkland. The foreshore area would be for the park, while other land would be subdivided into housing blocks. The tourism portion of the project could see a motel built along with a marina. Lake Macquarie Mayor Alderman Ivan Welsh believes we'll some concessions PTI, may have to be sure made to the developer group to obtain the park. I don't think anybody gives away 50% of their land without some concessions. So what might you have to do? Well, um, possibly uh, turn a blind eye to some small infringements here and there, I would think, or uh, allow uh, allow development which would make it more viable so that the developer does uh, make some money out of the development rather than just give us half and keep half. The land in being light of the fact for the developer group at Greens Point is for a dollars but the says that won't stand in the way of the undertaken by council, Alderman Welsh admits it's unusual that he doesn't know the name of the group involved. Yes, it's, uh, it, it is different, but uh, we, we engaged a firm of consultants, Kinhill, and uh, they are doing all the, all the work. Council has, has backed off on this one and they're going to do all the front. They're going to do the uh, consultation. They're also going to do the, uh, the, the forums with the, with the public and the uh, exhibitions and, and everything else that uh, has up to now been wasting Council's time with uh, the protest groups. This is going to involve some rezoning. This probably won't please some people. I'm sure it won't. Nothing does. Um, but the rezoning we're talking about here is we're rezoning from rural, which is um, allowed to be developed, uh, into uh, a residential zoning, but more of that will be developed into a 6A or 6C zoning, which is uh, public recreation reservations. Alderman Welsh and, uh, says the developer group has already yeah, entered into a multi-million dollar contract to buy the Greenpoint land, subject well, to rezoning. That, that depends on council approval. 
Development plans are expected to go on public display within three weeks. BHP wants to spend $192 million building a mini mill in Sydney's west. It's already purchased a parcel of land and is ready to start construction as soon as possible. The mini mill would melt scrap steel in an electric furnace to produce lower grade steels. This would then free up capacity at the Newcastle works to produce high quality special grade steels. And it's these which are in most demand by overseas customers. But a major setback for the company last night when the Blacktown Council said no to BHP's application. We believe that uh, it was an incorrect decision and uh, that's especially true since uh, it was the subject of a very extensive review by an independent authority who uh, indicated that it was quite an appropriate development for the site. So what's the next move now for BHP? Does it stop there? Oh no, we intend to exercise our right to appeal to the Land and Environment Court. Why have you decided that it must be located in Sydney rather than in Newcastle or anywhere else? Sydney is where the customers are, the major bulk of customers. It's also the source of raw material, that is scrap, and these mills all over the world are sited within striking distance of those uh, important ingredients. The company is confident it will win its appeal in the Land and Environment Court and is continuing planning for the mill at Rooty Hill in Sydney's west.